The year is 1998, and along past his prime champion is suiting up for what will end up being the last respectable run of his career in NASCAR. In an odd twist of fate, all-time great Darrell Waltrip would be suiting up to pilot none other than his former rival's car, for the Intimidator, Dale Earnhardt. But to understand this, we must go back to old DW's heyday. Darrell Waltrip started racing in NASCAR's top division all the way back in 1972 at a part-time basis. By 75, he was both a cup winner and a full-time driver as well. And by the closing of the 70s, he was a perennial title contender with Die Guard. But before 1981, he made a career-defining move by jumping over to Junior Johnson's team. His first two seasons were championship winning ones, with a win clip of 24 victories in 61 races, a 39% win percentage. He stayed with Johnson through 1986, winning a third title along the way, before going to the young upstart Hendrick Motorsports. This run of his career being defined by one spectacular moment in particular. But for 1991, Waltrip made a move that would lead to the inevitable downfall of his career, going independent. While nabbing three top 10 points finishes in the first four years between 91 and 94, he also would go winless in the latter half of that stint. By 1995, the team's condition worsened to a 19th place points finish, and 1996 would be the first time in any season ever, full or part-time, that he went without a top five. And in 1997, he even missed the fall Charlotte race. It was clear by 98 that Old Jaw's team was shrinking and a sinking ship between the poor performance and now sponsorship woes. By the fifth race of the season, it was over. Walter would sell off his assets to try and make some of the money back and leave the driver owner sphere. But as fate would have it, an opportunity did open up for him at DEI. DEI had begun cup racing at a part-time level in 97 and full-time in 98 with a young Steve Park. Park looked ready to be the next elite cup driver under the tutelage of team owner Dale Earnhardt. But unfortunately, injury had other things to say about that. With the driver the one out, Earnhardt turned to his old rival turned friend with DW to be a relief driver. And initially, it was rough. Two DNFs started off the run before a mid-pack finish at Talladega. But in a turn of fate that was also good, Fontana gave the Grizzly veteran his final top five finish of his career. By Pocono's first race, Waltrip had gotten into his groove. Little did anyone know, leading up to it, that this would be the final defining race of his career. Starting off in the 18th position, the Pennzoil Chevy had a respectable qualifying run. With the green flag out, the race was on, and as the opening laps ticked off, well, the contenders of the day asserted themselves. The story of the year was all about Jeff Gordon and Mark Martin, but it was actually Jeremy Mayfield, who was from the same town as Darrell Waltrip, who had the quickest car, searching for his first win. Though he wouldn't be able to really be all that happy about it, as the worry in the back of their minds would be of teammate Rusty Wallace having engine woes. Meanwhile, in all of this, Waltrip had been steady in the back half of the top 20, feeling out his car. This was really the name of the game for Waltrip in this machine, trying to keep the car clean for the end of the day and avoid trouble and the near-continuous engine issues. By the day's end, 12 drivers would DNF due to engine or mechanical failures, and add to this the threat of wildlife and weather, and you have a crazy event. Well, they've got that wascally wabbit up against the wall. <laughs> oh, and they got him. There you oh, go. Oh, bless their hearts. Good job. The quiet day was only more emphasized for DW by the fact that he wasn't even mentioned or on screen during the race until lap 56 of 200. This marked when he entered the top 15. The 51-year-old even led a lap, well, unofficially, during a pit cycle marking two weeks in a row that he would be seen up front. And under the overcast Pennsylvania sky, he managed to climb his way up to be just outside the top 10, right behind his buddy, Dale Earnhardt. In NASCAR's 50th season, a vintage battle would be taking place, this time for the 10th position between the aforementioned Earnhardt and DW, as well as Bill Elliott. All three passed their prime, passed their best days, but 
posting respectable performances against one another. Again, a green flag run would cycle DW to the front, but again, he also would not officially lead a lap as he pit beforehand. But this did show an opportunity that could be used later, if it presented itself. Once again, with 68 to go, rain unfortunately slowed the event, and this time, Waltrip sat in the 10th position. So even if these small showers somehow ended the day, it would be a great run for the DEI team. Luckily, it didn't, though. But it did at least end the slew of long runs, as sporadic cautions would define the end of the race. With 50 laps left, Debris brought out the yellow, DW now sitting ninth on the track. This moment would change the complexion of the day. While the leaders took four tires and fuel, some took two, including the Penzoil machine. Now, with 47 to go, Waltrip would restart in third. Leader Dale Jarrett had no fresh rubber, so the restart would be hectic. And heading into one, DW dived down, testing for a possible three-wide pass for the lead, and maybe even getting the win. It looked like old Daryl Waltrip. Mayfield, Martin, and all those with four freshies, though, caught the three-time champ with 40 to go, and while Mayfield got passed with ease, second place Kyle Petty lost all pressure, and this spotted Waltrip another spot, which he was able to retain for a while, holding off the rest of the guys with better rubber. And with 30 to go or so, the yellow would fly again for Dan Marino's number 13 car causing a caution, and again, it would help the one squad, as Waltrip would come in and pit again. Stops have been made, and that's right, folks. D.W. No doubt grinning like a Cheshire cat. He's leading here at Pocono. The green is in the air. Now let's see if Darrell Waltrip can hold off that snarling mess behind him. What a great shot. <laughs> wow, look at, look at Bobby Labonte all the way to the bottom. That little blob that you saw there was just used rubber that fell out from under a race car. Nothing to worry about. Oh, Earnhardt was right up <laughs> under. While running away to start, both Jeff Gordon and Jeremy Mayfield were hunting him down. And once again, a caution, the penultimate caution of the day, would preserve his lead. With 21 to go, the green flew again. Making, I'll tell you what, he's heating the water up right now for Walter. You can see him going through the flat corner there. Jeremy's got a very fast car as he draws within inches as they head down the front straightaway. For the lead at Pocono. And Jeremy is eyeing his first career win. This would end up being the pass for the win. As Mayfield ran away with his first win, Waltrip's tires faded on his positioning and his car. Still, he vied for a top five spot, racing guys like Gordon, Jarrett, and Jeff Burton hard. At the end of the day, though, he would be able to hold off Wally Dellenbach to get a sixth place finish. While Jeremy Mayfield's first win was a big one, his childhood hero's vintage run may have been just as big of a story that day. His emotional post-race interview spoke not only to Steve Burns, the interviewer, but to the millions at home watching him. Oh, we had a great day. The Penzoil Chevrolet, uh, Monte Carlo, she was right. Um, I'd tell you, gosh, darn it. Uh, whew, pretty, pretty exciting. And uh, I, I praise the Lord for a good day. And I, I'm so close to winning. Uh, it's it's big. This is big. Daryl, a lot of people left you for dead. Your career, you've shown them that you still have the fire. They didn't put quite enough dirt on me. Kicked it off and crawled back out. I've been in holes before and uh, crawled, crawling out of a pretty deep one right now, but damn, this is good. <laughs> Daryl, Jeremy... I mean, darn, this is good. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Jeremy said that his fantasy, he lied in bed at night to win a race was to pass you also from owensboro kentucky oh yeah what a what a kid i mean there he is he's out there just doing his thing you know and i'm thinking the same thing i'm saying well if one big old kid can do it maybe another one can and uh what a spectacular job uh, he's a champion i love him to death and uh i'm just so proud of him and everybody from owensboro i'm sure is too i say hello to mom and dad and all the dads happy father's day and uh dad gone I, I'm just so pleased. I just can't tell you. It, uh, it, it brings tears to my eyes to be able to, to get back out there and compete like this. I never thought I'd see it. I thought I was done. But I'm doing pretty good right now. 
Waltrip would later credit Dale Earnhardt for revitalizing his career even for a brief time. And while his stint at DEI only lasted 13 races, it also has lasted the test of time for the past near 25 years, as one of the best feel-good stories in NASCAR history. In the 50th season of NASCAR, one of the best drivers ever, who had raced in over half the history of the sport to that point, had one final shot at glory. After this, he would move on to the Fox booth, where he'd have a great career and become one of the greatest driver commentators the sport has ever seen. But with all that, I'm going to pass this on to you. What is your favorite feel-good story in NASCAR history? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel for more great NASCAR content. Thank you all my channel members for your continued support. And until next time, have a good one.